So uh, everyone here understands how critical innovation and leadership is to developing high-performing organizations. And by virtue of your very presence here today, you're actively looking for ways to improve your own performance and the performance of your team. To build on this topic of developing high-performance teams through innovation, I'm excited to introduce Bradley Hartman to the stage. Bradley has, has led his training and consulting firm for the past 12 years, helping the LBM industry make it easier for your customers to buy based on his experience working for a national home builder, to improve accountability and profitability through coaching sales managers and executives, and leverage advanced sales analytics to understand, predict, and change sales behaviors on the job. Bradley is the author of 12 books. His most recent on LBM negotiation you now have should have been in your welcome bag. And that was, Curtis, that was thanks to a sponsorship by Feeney. Um, he teaches in the construction management programs at Texas A&M, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State University, and hosts the Construction Leadership Podcast. I'd like to welcome Bradley Hartman to the stage to share his keynote, The Bike Shed Effect, How to Break Free and Innovate Now. All right, let's go. Uh, but first, I think anyone who has put on an event like this, a couple hundred people, three full days, different city, you understand how much work goes into this. So I want to recognize Rick and then Michelle, and Michelle and Jody and the new people, Sally and Wendy, <laughs> Tina, thank you very much. All right, now let's talk about you guys, what's happening? So in the space right now, ongoing consolidation continues. The big dealers are getting bit bigger and they're gonna be leveraging their economies of scale to kind of drive the price down even further. Uh, commodity pricing volatility is affecting us as we try to figure out how to buy better, but also really negatively impacting our builders, trying to figure out how they're not building homes for practice day after day after day. Continuing labor shortage for us, it's getting harder to get qualified talent, but certainly in the field as well. And this is gonna continue, it's only gonna get worse in the coming years and decades. We have an aging workforce, a lot of really talented, experienced experts are moving on to their fourth quarter. Some of them are giving us lots of runway to understand when that's happening, others not so much. And what we see with our clients is generally, a lot of folks are thinking about wealth protection versus new value creation. Seems like they're playing more defense than offense. And as we've been working with clients all across the country, I've come to believe there's really only four durable competitive advantages. We can learn faster, we control that internally. Uh, we can really understand how to empathize deeper with our customers, truly understand what their challenges are, really observe the work that's happening, and then we can consistently differentiate. Make sure internally in our teams it's really clear how what we do is different than what the competition does. And then we just gotta communicate the hell out of that time and time again. So what's stopping us from doing that? Well, a lot of other BS. So I hired an intern for the summer and I was going through our Monday meeting. I was probably about seven or eight minutes into a digression that involved invoices and I have a some OCD tendencies when it comes to typeface selections and font sizes and white space. And I wanted each one of these requests slash demands for money to be a little work of art. And the intern said, Bradley, can I call BS here? I said, oh, sure, intern. What about this is bullshit? And he goes, whoa, 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 no, no, no. No, I would never say that to you. Not that BS, the other BS. I said, there is no other BS. He said, yes, there is. I said, tell me more. And he said, BS is bike shedding. I said, I've never heard of bike shedding. What's bike shedding? He goes, bike shedding comes from the coding and programming world. And it depicts a team of leaders that are responsible for approving and reviewing and implementing a very complex power plant. And there's lots of details. And there's so many decisions to be made. They don't focus on those. They focus on something minor. They focus on the employee bike shed. How big should it be? Does it need to be secure? Right? What if we leverage our core value of health and wellness and get bikes for everybody? They're all the same, you just grab a bike and go wherever you want. Or what if we have a steering committee and we talk to bike shed experts, real company, crazy. 
right? What are they doing? Over time, they are focusing on the simple instead of the complex. We're focusing on the trivial instead of the important. And I think yesterday someone said it from the stage. They said, we're majoring in the minor. We have this big, hairy, complex issue, and we say, let's set that off aside, and let's focus it on something smaller, right? So I'll give you an example of bike shedding. I worked for a national home build in the Chicagoland area right around 2010, 2011. Many of you were on this ride. It wasn't fun, but we made it through. So we were negotiating with the union in Chicago, specifically with the drywall and the painters. Mr. Jim Sobeck described his uh, murderous tendencies yesterday from the stage with union officials. These are the same people we were dealing with. So we were gonna cut our labor rate in a third. It was really gonna change and we had 90% fewer closings, 90% fewer employees I was working with. And into the fray comes a vice president who I really admired, smart guy. He comes and he goes, hey, whatever you're doing, just stop doing it. We need savings immediately, I have an idea. I said, what is it? I need you to immediately remove all towel bars and toilet paper holders from every house we're building. I need you to tell me how much money we'd be saving. I said, do you want me to include an analysis of how much we're going to annoy our customers? He says, no, that is unnecessary. Let's ignore that. This is bike shedding. I was with a client recently and she came up. For the last three years, she has tripled the overall profitability of the design department of cabinetry. And she said, I showed up here 10 years ago, and one of my first jobs was to work the counter, and I figured out how to use the key machine. I'm very good at the key machine. It is not strange for someone to interrupt me designing a six-figure kitchen for someone to go cut $3 worth of keys. Is that bike shedding? Sure, that can be bike shedding. And I think our industry in general, when it comes to innovation, I think we're bike shedding. I think we're focusing on ways that are gonna help us do a little bit better, but still compete head to head on the same different value elements than all of our competition. But not everybody is. Home Depot is innovation awards. They're giving innovation awards to people. Where are our innovation awards? LBM Journal, this is an idea, let's do it. Why don't we celebrate some things that are working really well, some new innovative ideas? Let's also celebrate the things that didn't work, but were also good ideas. How can we become more innovative? But how do we sell that as a priority in our organizations? And every salesperson knows we gotta answer this question, what's in it for you? So in the balance of our time together this morning, we're gonna offer up a framework, three-step framework, to lead with more innovation within your teams. We're gonna identify a few current examples that I think are ripe for innovation. We're also gonna go over several examples from other domains that I think are gonna resonate with you as well. We're gonna allow you to download a tool for better decision making to see if our predictions about what's gonna happen in the future with innovation are accurate. And ultimately, my hope is to give you more confidence to leave at nine o'clock and start thinking differently on how you can lead with more innovative ideas. So, uh, where's Allison? Yes, you're Allison. Okay, you wanna grab that microphone? When we were talking earlier, you are giving me the face like you wanna be involved, you want to be part of this, you wanted to stand up, and okay. have, you wanted to stand up. So, oh, you got a pair of opportunities, right? How old are you, if you mind me asking? 33. 33, career's on the rise, right? Hopefully. Yes, it is. <laughs> Russ said so, okay? So you got two opportunities in front of you. One of them, sizable market, existing customer base that you can talk to, there's high margins and plenty of data. This is opportunity one that you can hitch your career to, all right? Overall, how do you feel about this opportunity? Feels pretty good, but I don't know what option number two is. You do not, Okay. but you will. Okay, great. Here's opportunity number two. Opportunity number two is, it is um, a small or unknown market. Can't really talk to your existing customer base. Not sure if it's really relevant for them. Some of them have said outright, I don't really want that. Uh, margins are gonna be low, and there's no data on this. I'll give you a minute. This is a big decision for you and your career. Does one of these seem more appealing to you? I'm gonna have to go with option number one. That's why, you little, why? Why one? It feels safer. Feels safer. There's more known. There's more known. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming. Right? Yes. Yes, Jeff. Thank you, Allison. Yes. Smart managers, listening to your best customers, pursuing higher margins. 
Smart people like Allison, listen to your best customers, pursuing higher margins. How can that be not a great choice? Feels right. But if we look at the literature, In Search of Excellence came out, Tom Peters, Bob Waterman, 1982. They listed a whole bunch of companies. Within five or six years of those companies, of reading about those companies that were excellent, they were either obsolete or were a punchline. Then 12 years later, 1994, Built to Last comes, Jim Collins, Jerry Porras, five to six years after that. Almost every single one of those companies was either a punchline or obsolete. 2001, Good to Great comes along. One of the best-selling business books of all time, almost every one of those companies was either obsolete or a punchline. Why? They had a lot of really smart people listening to their best customers, pursuing higher margins, and that is exactly what took them off the cliff. Why? This is why it's so hard for organizations to continue to be great year after year. And I think we've all experienced this to some degree. We start an organization, we have some level of performance, and we have some level of profitability. And over time, we increase our performance, we increase our profitability, and we move up to the right. Then something new comes along. And human beings have a very consistent, predictable reaction when something new comes along, especially if the performance requirements are lower. What do we do? First of all, we make fun of it. Kind of laugh about it, it's cute, it's adorable. I don't think it's gonna be a problem. Then we ignore it, and we give this new thing room to grow, and then it starts attacking some of our market share. We get a little bit fearful, and then we choose to copy it generally too late. Why? Every day there's a daily crisis. We are solving some issue right now, and we are feeding yesterday, and we're starving tomorrow. How many of you right now, where are we, 12 minutes in, are dealing with some sort of daily crisis? Somebody sent you something, you're thinking in the back of mind, I'm not sure if it's worth to listen to this ginger for the next 45 minutes. I've got to deal with a crisis. Anybody dealing with a crisis right now? I, I, I can't tell if you're wiping something out of your eye or you're raising your hand, Russ. I'll just go with it, yes. Why? Other Russ. You're not the only Russ in the room. Get over yourself. <laughs> Jesus. It's not true. So how do we move beyond this? All right, three-step framework. Number one, lead with language. What are the terms, what are the vocabulary we use to get people thinking about innovation? Number two, look beyond lumber. Let's look outside our domain. And number three, how can we learn by predicting? So that's what we'll go over. So lead with language. Real simple definition. You can just think of two words when it comes to innovation. It's uh, something different that has impact. Different and impact. Easy definition, if people start talking about sustaining innovation versus disrupting innovation, it's irrelevant. God bless you, right? Is it different? Does it have an impact? This gentleman was 50 years old and he was managing a radiator factory. Up to this point in his life, it was unremarkable. Within five years, he would change the world with his innovation, and within 10, he would be a billionaire. He came across the option to purchase an old metal press. So him and his wife started a side business. They started cranking out brass hinges for windows and doors. Then they moved on to curtain rods. True story, the curtain rods were of such high quality, the government said, can you manufacture field knives for the military? They said yes. Him and his wife are cranking out thousands of field knives. He was in Congress, and he overheard two lieutenants talking about a request for proposal for a new gun. And he said, excuse me, I make knives. Can I submit a bid for guns? Appropriately, they laughed at him and said, sure, what the hell? Go knock your socks off. He had never owned a gun. He had never fired a gun. So at this point in time, Smith & Wesson, the Smith & Wesson 645, essentially had a monopoly on government and municipal weapons. So if somebody had a gun circa 1980, almost 100% it was this gun. And Smith & Wesson had been around for a long time, since 1852, and had 130 years of dominance, right? Something new comes along, they paid little attention to it. Again, within five years, this gentleman who had never owned a gun and never fired a gun changed the world. His name was Gaston Glock. And he said that I knew nothing was to my advantage. So what did he do? Started with lower performance metrics, with an ugly gun, people made fun of him. And then he attacked Smith and Wesson. And if you look at some of the requirements and some of the choices that he made, the 645 was made in the USA, it was stainless steel, it was beautiful. When the Glock came out, the Glock 17 was the first one, 
Unanimously, people said, this is ugly. And by the way, a gun that is made in a foreign country will never be sold here. Sold pretty well. You looked at the requirements. Had twice as many bullets were in it. Uh, the price was almost 27% cheaper. The weight of it was almost 40% lighter. The trigger travel, how far the trigger had to move before it was fired, 60% less. The trigger action, how much weight had to be applied to shoot the gun, was almost 65% less. And parts, it had almost a third as many parts, fewer parts for things to go wrong. And when it came to Hollywood, guns are in lots of movies, Smith & Wesson charged Hollywood full price. Glock essentially gave them away for free. If the Smith & Wesson was in a movie, the executives had to sign off on it. If anybody said Smith & Wesson or referred to the 645, Smith & Wesson had to sign off on it. Glock did not care at all. John McClain, he's got a little problem. Hell, let's shut down the whole airport. Now, what do you think they're going to say upstairs when I tell them that? Why don't you pick up the phone and find out? Because I don't need full forensics to tell me all this was was some punk stealing luggage. Luggage? That punk pulled a Glock 7 on me. You know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. Doesn't show up on your airport x-ray machines. They're going to cost more than you make it a month. You'd be surprised what I make in a month. Can anyone name that greatest Christmas movie of all time? <laughs> Anybody? Die Hard, Levi, which one? False, you get nothing, okay? <laughs> Die Hard 2, Allison, thank you. Hey, there you go. Die Hard, who said Die Hard 2? Anybody say Die Hard 2? Yes, you don't, don't be shy about Dennis. You know your cinema, there you go. Uh, yeah, so everything John McClain just said there to Lieutenant Lorenzo was false. 100% of the things he said, he said it's porcelain, it's not, it's plastic. He said it was made in Germany, it's not, it's made in Austria. He said it doesn't show up on your x-ray, it does. And he said it costs more than Lieutenant Lorenzo makes in a month, it doesn't. It was $360 wholesale, 26.5% cheaper than a 645. Glock, didn't care, right? They wanted the publicity. So what happens? Stage one, we make fun of it. Stage two, we ignore it. Stage three, we fear it. Stage four, we copy it. Even diehard Smith & Wesson fans, when the Smith & Wesson Sigma showed up, the collective reaction was, oh no, we just copied it. Three years later, they settled out of court for a multi-million dollar claim. We're talking with one of our clients. They want to be more innovative. They want to do things different. They have 11 core values on their website. Number seven is we will be faster, better, and cheaper every single day. Now, like, that's innovation, right? I'd say, well, I would challenge that a little bit. What you're describing is running the same race as everybody else. I just want to do it just a little bit better and faster. What we want to do is run a completely different race. How can we make the differences really obvious? And we know that people are really adaptable. We've been through the pandemic. We know how quickly are people going to adapt to new conditions. However, our values and our processes do not change unless you allow them to. So where's the vocabulary about innovation? How many of you have core values that say, we will be more innovative? We're not gonna be perfect, but we're gonna try to do it. Jeff, congratulations, thank you. I appreciate the participation. You want one of these? Fine, fine, there you go, good. I'll continue, all right? So processes, do we have processes that support more innovation? How do we go about doing that? How comfortable are we saying, this might not work? It sounds like, I get the vibe from listening to the Walker Lumber Crew yesterday. Sometimes, somebody said, I don't know, Ray had like 5,000 new ideas. My guess is Ray says, I, I don't have to bat 1,000. This might not work, but some of them might. The Second Chance Program, I'm sure someone said, this might not work. That's okay. How do we drive this innovation as leaders? We think about what we do. Our builders are building homes on different lots in different climate conditions with different municipal inspectors, with hundreds of different people on thousands of different products. It is decentralized manufacturing. If anybody says, let me just play devil's advocate here. The devil needs no advocate in our business. It is with us every single day. I need someone to say, what would have to be true for these things to happen? When you say what would have to be true, you end up reverse engineering the criteria to continue to pursue this. I can only imagine with Preston Feather and Newberry Homes, somebody said, what would have to be true if we build a 90,000 square foot home 
on a lake. I don't know, we're gonna chop up a canoe and make a bar out of it. And they're like, yes, totally, right? And we're gonna do it in like 10 months. If someone says, oh, let me play devil's advocate here. Nobody did that. Somebody said, what would have to be true to make this happen? And they did. We need to be aware of this idea of overshooting, delivering more value to customers when they don't want it. When we think about this idea of custom home builders and we group them all together, how many of you right now have salespeople who are out there and they are complaining about serving accounts, good people who are transactional, who are not proactive, who refuse to have a production meeting, and they're driving each other crazy. Do any of you guys have any of these customers? Two of you. Okay, I find that hard to believe, but that's fine, <laughs> right? And they're like, I don't know, these customers don't get it. And I'm like, they're telling you. Your customers are telling you you're delivering all this value, and they're like, I don't really want it. I want a low price. It's possible. They're telling us, I question if we're listening sometimes. And you guys have any of these briefcase builders? I will generalize, they are generally younger, they generally have money, they generally watch HGTV and say, look at these knuckleheads, how hard can this be? And then we have salespeople who treat them like everybody else, like they're these third generation custom home builders who are craftsmen, who've studied this and lived it their entire lives. Do we give, do we give them different value? Nope. This is what we do, right? And then these people drive us crazy. I would charge them more money. They don't know what they're doing, okay? So the question is, how often do we eliminate and reduce? Our industry is great at adding things. What's on the not to-do list? We have all this value we provide, maybe to the briefcase builder, we start removing some stuff. Raise our profitability, charge them what they want. So how do we eliminate and reduce? I also wonder if we're undershooting. Do any of you live in an area that has a large Hispanic demographic or one that is growing? Right? That's everybody, thank you. Right? Different cultural values, often. Different language preferences. Do we have a strategy that says, I think this is underserved, and it is generally underserved across the entire country. A recession's gonna come and someone's gonna say, where are we gonna get more money? Are there any customer segments that are currently underserved that we could pursue? We know who they are. We know exactly who they are. And, and yes, if you've got somebody named Carlos and he speaks Spanish, that's great. But I would question you guys, if there's not a strategy, there's not a plan, and there's not goals and objectives and we're not measuring it, you're probably not doing enough. How can we serve these folks and every other different customer segment, not based on how we deliver value, on how they want value? So, that's leading with language. This might not work. Overshooting, right? Now, look beyond lumber. I was describing this idea just about, yes, we can always learn more from visiting another lumber yard and talking to smart people. I would encourage us to continue doing that. I was working with a client, I said, I wanna figure out, let's do the opposite. I don't know what going to the opposite of a lumber yard is, but we should do that. And he said, oh, this is like the Costanza principle. I said, I'm sorry? He goes, the Costanza principle. That's what you're talking about. What am I supposed to do? Go talk to her. Elaine, bald men with no jobs and no money who live with their parents <laughs> don't approach strange women. Well, here's your chance to try the opposite. Instead of tuna salad and being intimidated by women, chicken salad and going right up to them. Yeah, I should do the opposite. I should. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. <laughs> Yes, I will do the opposite. I used to sit here and do nothing and regret it for the rest of the day. So now I will do the opposite and I will do something. Excuse me, uh, I couldn't help but notice that you were looking in my direction. <laughs> oh, yes, I was. You just ordered the same exact lunch as me. <laughs> my name is George. I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. I'm Victoria, hi. <laughs> the Costanza Principle. So last year at this event, we were talking about this idea. We were kind of taking money ball analytics and applying them to sales. And we're about nine months into something called the National Sales Analytics Association getting dealers to share numbers on a monthly basis, 
And we contracted with a boutique analytics firm who's got three really smart PhDs who ask very simple questions about why we do things and how we form teams and overhead structures, looking for new patterns about how we drive profitability and revenue. And we were saying, hey, when we all get together, we were gonna meet in Dallas, what could we do that would be the opposite of a lumberyard tour? So we ended up leveraging a relationship and we met with the chief revenue officer of the Texas Rangers. And we got a tour of their entire stadium and they were sharing the different software they use. They use, they're talking about facial recognition and how when you walk in, they can figure out how long it takes you to get your seat. They explained to us how in the old, the new stadium, there's 8,000 fewer seats and fewer suites, and yet they make significantly more money. We got done with that and we went to this small bat company. If you guys have kids uh, in baseball, it's the War Stick Bat Company. And they are kind of changing uh, the mold for and branding around metal bats. So we went to their headquarters and we saw how they use different spaces to see, uh, they have manufacturing, they also had office space, they had retail, they had an experiential part with a batting cage where you could use the bats. And yes, if we wanted to play devil's advocate, we could walk and say none of this would work for us. Instead we went in and said what would have to be true for some of these methods to work for us? And then we got out, and I don't know if you, any of you guys read this. Is Jason still here, Jason Blair? How are you? There's you, yeah. Nope, not at all. Here you are, okay? So we get out, we get done, and I read this, and Jason's talking about placemaking. In our business, we love talking about this being a relationship business. And we left Warstick, and one of the attendees said, Bradley, I get what you're saying, that Warstick place is amazing, however, some of our best customers will never ever come to one of our showrooms. I said, why is that? It's a relationship business. Why are we allowing it to be a long distance relationship? And I kind of half jokingly said, what if we call this the seventh place? Right? Starbucks has a third place. It's not work, it's not home, it's Starbucks. I'll say, well, it's not work, it's not home, it's not Starbucks. You think of the business owner who's a builder out there, right? He doesn't want to work from his car, right? Doesn't want to work from the job site, and he doesn't want to work from the bar. There, seventh place. Could this be a place where they come, and they have a really nice color printer, and they have coffee, and they have a wide open table, and they have magazines, they have LBM Journal, they also have Luxury Magazine, they have Wired Magazine, Fast Company, giving them new ideas. Let's put cool artwork on the walls to give them inspiration and say, yes, this space might sit empty for 90% of the time, but when you need a refuge, you can come here, and this is yours, and we're gonna give you a little bit of status. Only you and five other owners can come in, or whatever that is. Now, can I punch holes into this thing? I can, right? What would have to be true? Let's play a little game of name that innovation. Jeff, what was the innovation here in the trampoline? Did you ever have a trampoline when you were growing up? One day I came home, I was probably like 12, my dad's like, we got a new trampoline. It was new to us, it was not new. It was old and rusty, and it was like eight feet wide, and four, or eight feet long, and four feet wide. 32 square feet sounds like a lot, until you get like five feet in the air, and it feels very dangerous. My neighbor Marcus came over, second day in, flipped off and broke his arm. What's the innovation here? Some sort of cage, yeah. There's two main risks here. You just flip off the thing and break your arm, or you land on the springs, which, I mean, that's no good, right? So what did they do? The risks were obvious. They listened to their customers, and they solved those. So let's think about our customers. When it comes to volatility, there's two main issues there. Number one, just pure high prices. Did they anticipate this to make sure they're profitable building homes? The second part is, are they overpaying? So we have two different clients in two different parts of the country that are saying, I can't solve the former but I can solve the latter. I can make sure you feel confident that you are always getting our best prices. They're being transparent. They're collaborating more closely and saying, you're not gonna get the lowest price in the market. If you wanna look at our books, I will tell you exactly what you need and I'm gonna give you the best price that we're giving anybody. They're giving them peace of mind. The other issue is labor. They're worried about downtime. My framer shows up, material's not there. They leave, I don't see them again for a week, right? I'm losing cycle time costing me more money, what can we do? They're experimenting with some price innovation similar to what they do in mining operations. 
And these mining operations, when it comes to oil and lubrication, they do not charge by the court, they don't charge by the gallon, they don't buy the container or the truck. What do they do? They charge by downtime. Saying, listen, whatever these giant pieces of equipment need, I'm gonna solve that, I'm gonna guarantee 99% uptime. That's the guarantee. It is completely divorced from how much a quart of oil costs. It's irrelevant. This is what they're paying for. They're paying for peace of mind. I don't know if it'll work. We're moving forward, we're talking to our customers and seeing if they wanna pay a little more for peace of mind. I think some of them will. Speaking of excavation, in 1837, the first steam shovel was introduced, mechanized excavation became real. And it started off similar to what we were talking about before. Relatively low performance, relatively low profitability. But over time, it grew. And there's a few different kind of step changes that happened in the industry. First was from steam to gasoline, gasoline to diesel electric. And if you look at the companies that were involved in this space, uh, 23 out of 24 made that first jump from steam to gas. From gas to diesel electric, 29 out of 29. Everybody made these two until it came to hydraulic. Hydraulics were introduced in excavation equipment in 1947, and they looked like this. They were small, the arm was shorter, the bucket was smaller, and the big manufacturers went to their customers and said, what do you guys think of this? They're like, this is a toy, it's a joke. I want something bigger, stronger, faster. And the companies that listen to their best customers, smart managers, listening to your best customers, pursuing higher margins, missed one of the largest opportunities in the history of construction. Started with Levittown and the rise of suburbia. Uh, 1957, looked like this, and on a job site like this, do I need some giant backhoe that can dig 100 feet in the ground? I don't. Most of these were slabs. I need something small, maneuverable, short arm, that's better. Smaller bucket, even better, right? So making this final transition, only four out of 32 organizations. Four out of 32 companies that were all looking around saying, I'm listening to our best customers, we're hiring smart managers, we're pursuing higher margins, only four out of 32. And many of those say, listen, we're experts at what we do, we've been doing this for 100 years. And just like that, they were gone. But not really. In the construction industry, it's not just like that. This happened over the course of 20 years. However, come 1972, 100% of the entire market was hydraulic. Many of these folks missed it. How many of you are familiar with Renault Run? You guys have Renault Run in your market? Renault Run, you, it's a, based on an app, call them up, they will go visit a store, they might even visit one of your locations, they visit Home Depot and they run it out to them. So, Renault Run got introduced and I was talking to a builder in Chicago, he's like, these guys are awesome. I use them probably twice a day. It's like, it's so cheap, I have no idea how they make money. They don't make money, they just went bankrupt, okay? However, <laughs> we laugh, we can kind of ridicule, right? Uh, however, you also got Dispatch, we got Rody. Rody's backed by UPS, interesting. And we got Dolly, lumber hauling in Atlanta. Now, maybe all of these are gonna go BK. Maybe all of them go to zero. But these people aren't idiots. I was talking to a dealer in Philadelphia and he said, Reno Run was in our area. They would come to our location, buy material and go deliver it to our customers. He's like, we were scratching our heads trying to figure out why. I said, I think you know why. Your builders think they can get it faster by using them and cheaper. This is happening to us right now. Bowen's in Australia has formally aligned with Uber. This gives every salesperson at Bones a reason to call up every single customer and every single non-customer and say, we're gonna do something different and it's gonna have an impact. Let me tell you this story. And if you look at Bowens, if you look at Bowens, founded in 1894, 19 locations, $400 million, fourth generation, this could be us. How long has Uber been around? Why aren't we collaborating with them? Have we tried? Right? How are we telling a different story? How are we doing something different with impact? Let's just say hypothetically Amazon, while we're in here, $1.3 trillion market cap buys BFS. About 15 billion more or less market cap. They buy them today. Amazon's now in charge. My guess is many of you in this room would leave and say, all right, what do I think Amazon is gonna do? WWAD, what would Amazon do? 
And if any of you work for Builders First Source and your new bosses are Amazon, I think you're probably going to be doing something different as well. You're going to be transforming tomorrow in probably a different way. Let's not wait for the threat. We see these opportunities, how do we go after it? Because once the writing is on the wall, everyone can read it. We look back and it seems obvious. So lead with language, look beyond lumber, and then learn by predicting. So at this point, if I wander around and I happen to like touch you on the shoulder, it is extremely deliberate. I need you to rise up with a smile on your face. Thank you. And just go to the front of the stage, Matt Simonic. Go ahead, get up there. You're making a note. Thank you. Yes. You're not making eye contact. That doesn't work at all. Great. Uh, sir, what's your name? Carl. Carl, come on up. All right. Where, who, who else? Very, very slow to rise. Diane? Yes. Thanks for being here. Carl, where are you from? Utah. Utah. All right. Hello. Hello. Congratulations on being drafted. You guys can stand on the stage all the way up. Yeah. Yeah. This is going to be the interactive portion. Okay, so 1950s, roll around, meteorologists were just getting on television. As you can kind of see, they're trying to figure out this new medium, how it could be most effective to communicate what's going to happen in the future with something important as weather. Two differing effects, but one thing that wasn't happening was no one was giving the probability. No one was saying, hey, on Wednesday, with a 70% probability, it's going to rain. And someone else wasn't saying, actually, I think it's probably more of a 50-50 probability. We just don't know. So Glenn Breyer, he, was, he worked at the US Weather Bureau for 40 years. And he said, this isn't good enough. It's like, I want to know who the best meteorologists are. And to do that, I need them to predict what's going to happen in the future. And I need a confidence interval. I need to know how confident they are that's going to happen. He was the guy that started making that happen. And he came up with a score. It's called the Breyer score. Lower score is better. So point one is like Nostradamus, right? Level seeing, point five is a coin, flip, uh, flip of the coin, like a dart throwing monkey. And the question is, where are we in this continuum? You don't need to answer that now, okay? So what we're gonna do here is we're going to, let's go, Diane, why don't you come over here with Rob? Okay, you guys are a team, okay, and you guys are a team. I'm going to give you a sheet of paper, Diane, okay, Rob. What we're going to do is we're going to present a couple of events that are inherently unknowable until they actually happen here, okay? And I want you guys to understand the event that's going to happen, and then you're going to tell me to what degree you think it's going to happen. So we've got two teams. We're going to have three predictions. We've got to stay on schedule. We're going to keep it up. Matt, I'll get to you in a minute. Zero means it's impossible. What I'm about to, this event that we're gonna have that no one knows the outcome to, it is impossible, it will never happen. That's zero. 50 is, I don't know, 50-50, coin toss. 100% is 100% probability. Now, Caleb Grothaus, will you stand up, please? Caleb, introduce yourself. Actually, don't, just say hi. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's on me, I didn't, I didn't do that really. Caleb works for Palmer Donovan, he's a 40 under 40. By the way, all your 40 under 40, raise your hands. There you go. Thank you, Jeff. Lead the round of applause. All right. Now, Matt, you know why you're here. So yesterday I said, one of these events, oh, by the way, so this is the spreadsheet you are working. So you're going to give your probability score. He's going to plug it into Excel. And then after three events, we will crown a champion. Two of you will return to your seats in shame as losers. <laughs> Two of you will get great swag and go down as champions, OK? Caleb will do the math for us, all right? So you're gonna write down the probability this event will happen, and then you're gonna put yes or no, it did happen. We're gonna make this available for anyone who wanna download it. You go to bradleyhartmanandco.com, I know, super long URL, slash tools. You might need a password, I don't know why, it might be Hartman, I don't know. Anyway, this is available to you, okay? So here's the first one. Yesterday, the first event, I was kind of describing it, and I said to Matt, I'm like, Matt, you're probably aware that Frisbee Pie Company started in 1871 in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And he's like, yes, of course I know this. And he also knows that these Frisbee Pies were these kind of these metal things, and some drunk kid at Yale started stealing them and started throwing them around the quad. And Matt said, yes, I was an all-American Frisbee thrower my junior year of high school. Senior year, I told a rotator cuff. If there's a Frisbee here, and I quote, 
I'm going to be the best dangus frisbee thrower in the entire conference. That's what I recall. Is this about right? Maybe. Maybe. OK, so here's the first event. Matt, by the way, this sort of stunt, generally you have to ask for forgiveness. Here's a frisbee, OK? Now, uh, good looking ginger there with the arms crossed shorts. You wore shorts today. All right, going informal. Can you stand up, please? Actually, that's a terrible idea. Let's not do that. Uh, 40 under 40, sorry. Beard guy, you looking at me? Yeah, you. You stand up? All right. Matt, all American, junior year of high school, which was only like 40, yeah, two years ago, all right, is going to send this frisbee. Now, um, Let's see. Rick, you're going to be the judge. We are only saying, is he going to get it in the vicinity of, what's your name? Mark. Mark. In the vicinity of Mark. Mark doesn't have to catch it. It just needs to be catchable. Those are two different probabilities here, all right? So you guys are up first. What's the probability? He's going to throw this to be catchable to Mark right there. By the way, if anyone has any glassware on their tables, just protect it. <laughs> if you hit this, this is on you, man. Okay. 90, 90% here, okay? Team one, 90. Team two, 95. This is a ton of confidence. This is incredible. This is why we have live interaction. All right, Matt, whenever you're ready, let her fly. Hey! All right. You know, excuse me here. All right. Do you either have a house or a car? Yes. You're going to love that keychain. All right, you can leave now. OK. All right, there's the first one. You got it recorded. All right, 95% probability it did happen. Thank you, Mark. You can keep that, put that in your luggage on the way home. OK, so there we go. So you guys are leading at this point. The second event is going to be, I'm going to pick a random person out of the crowd to identify a state capital. OK. You guys are up first. Probability, I'm going to pick a random person, one of the 50 states, and say, name the capital of this state percentage. You can confer. What do you got? 70. OK. Seventy-five. 75. All right, 70 for team two. Whatever, you're paying attention. Uh, give me a number one through 10. Three. Okay, go one, two, three. Give me number one through six. You. Four. Okay, all right. One, two, three. Uh, pink shirt, beard, glasses. Can you stand up, please? What's your name? Mike. How do you feel about, there's only 50 states, there's only 50 capitals. How do you feel right now, strong or quite strong? I didn't, I didn't hear it. I heard pants. What's this? He needs new pants. <laughs> this is inherently unknowable. Life, it is, you know? All right, sir, are you ready? Okay. <laughs> okay. I had one state in mind, because sometimes people are like, I got a fifth grader, dominate. I'm like, okay, I'm going to give you a tough one. You? Given the pant crapping you're doing, I think we'll go with something a little bit easier. All right, we're gonna get a countdown of 10. I can't give you all day. By the way, from an audience standpoint, please do not blurt it out. You don't impress your friends. Just let this man wither in the wind until he answers, please. Can you name for me, sir, the capital of North Carolina? That is correct, well done. There. All right, final question. Can you uh, send this back to Mike? Oh, sorry, Wendy. Okay. All right, third one. Very good. That was correct. Most people say Charlotte. I said Charlotte. Nice work. Okay. All right, third question is oh, third question. It's a sports question. This is a sports question at the level of fifth grade. It's not going to confuse anyone. This is a knowable thing. This is all the information you're going to get. You guys are up first. Kind of, are you smarter than a fifth grader sports question? It's, it's a, it is a major-ish sport. Zero to 100. 
What do you guys give yourself? I see that you're using, you're not using the giant box I gave you. No, that's okay, you're fine. Uh, what number? Fifth grade, you guys got fifth graders? They went through fifth grade, presumably? Okay, I just need a number. We gotta keep this 100%. thing moving. 100%. Uh, 80%. 80%. All right, here's the question. Uh, give me a number one through 10. Six. 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 So I'm going back, I need uh, one through five. Five. Five, one, two, three, four. Uh, young lady, beige, yes. What's your name? Yeah. Can you stand up, please? Were you, just Goog were you just Googling sports questions smarter than a fifth grader? If so, you will be, I mean, you got a shot. All right, are you ready for the question? Again, nobody blurted out. Just let her handle it. Here's your question. In a women's collegiate volleyball game, just hang on, you'll be fine. In a women's collegiate volleyball game, how many athletes are on one side of the net during the game? Seven is absurdly close. The correct answer is six. All right, so Caleb, are we all set? Okay, so I don't know, you guys were team one? How did, how did Rob and Diane do? Team two, point three, six. Point all right. So point five, dart throwing monkey. Point one, Nostradamus, you guys are in the middle, that's good. All right, did they win? No. All right, you guys can get the hell off my stage. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, grab one of these. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Diane. I appreciate your help. That was not a nice way to have you exit. Uh, what did they end up with? 0. 0.24. 0. 0.24. All right. Round of applause. Congratulations. There you go. You. Get a hat. All right. All right. So this is a Briar score. We're going to make this available for you guys to download. I'll give you a business card or bradleyhartman.com slash tools. I think you have to do put in Hartman. And there's a whole bunch of tools in there. You can download this. We use this often with our executive coaching clients. Many of them struggle with this because I will say, hey, as we are 90 days out from the end of the year, how confident do you feel you will hit your profit targets? Normally, there's some sort of long answer. I said, no, I'm just looking for a number. What we're doing is making predictions to understand if our executives make sound decisions and can we learn from those over time. I've been doing this for a year and a half. It is extremely humbling. I am often overly confident and terribly wrong. I tell my team things. Sometimes I might be very aggressive and very outspoken. In the future, I will prove to be very wrong. You have permission to tell me this is a bad idea. Push back. But we gotta be comfortable with that. We have something called the simple sales pipeline, which is kind of like Salesforce, minus like 98% of all the other stuff that goes in it. Our commitment is one rep, one time a month, 30 minutes, we can organize, prioritize, and value, right? And in the upper left-hand corner in the green is the pipeline number staring at them. And then they have their revenue goal, and then we have the confidence level. Why? We can track over time the sales reps that say, all right, I got a $1.4 million pipeline, uh, my goal is 800,000, hell if I know. All right, we'll put it 50%. Versus someone else who says, oh, I'm 90% confident. And if you can have your team start understanding how confident and accurate they are, or confident and inaccurate, you as decision makers, purchasing managers, can make better decisions about what's coming. So the coolest basketball cards ever started from a tobacco company right down the road from us in Durham, North Carolina. And things were changing in the tobacco industry. Turns out it causes cancer. Who saw that coming? And someone says, we need new revenue. I think there's an innovation that can happen. What if, what if, instead of only one image on a card, there's two, two sides of the card, two photos. Had never been done before. So Michael Jordan on the cover, by the way, they photoshopped out the backboard. No one had ever seen Jordan dunking on just a floating rim out there. On the back was Jordan playing golf. Hey, he's, he's someone just like you. He's Michael Jordan, the guy next door. He also plays golf. They didn't give you all the stats from his entire career. They just showed you what he did over his career, one line, what he did last year compared to all the different guards. So they're not giving you all the data. The other ones did. 
Magic Johnsons, they'd give them Lakers colors. They also had a lot of cards that had people playing against other people. So all of a sudden, cards, which were always just one person, had multiple people in it. They'd also have things like this with terrible sweaters. They put them like glamour shots. And you guys do glamour shots, right? right? So we're a few minutes behind. You can now open up the envelopes that say do not open until <clears throat> 8.53. If, you are, if, if there's an empty table, you can feel free to snag those envelopes and distribute as you see fit. All right, did anybody get Mark Price? Anybody be, did anybody get a good one, like a hard like plastic one? Who'd you get over here? Carl Malone, all right. Got Reggie Miller, he's terrible, but that's fine, okay? Who'd you get? You got Mark Price. That's a special one, it's very good. Anybody get Jordan? I got Jordan over here, Magic, Magic, all right. Now, why, why am I giving this to you? Is it to show that the giving never ends? Yes, the giving never ends, you're welcome. That's not all of it, so there is this innovation, right? They started with this. Oh, and by the way, the other reason you can do this, the new book on negotiation, by the way, thank you to the folks at Feeney. You can go use this card. You can use it as a bookmark. <laughs> That's not the entire reason we gave this. So my father came to us 1991, so it came out a year after, for Christmas, and he said, there's this huge buzz about the Skybox company. There's graphics, they're, they're Photoshopping out backboards. There's colors. They got Mark Price in a terrible sweater, like, this is really gonna help you get closer to understand who these athletes are as people. And my brother and I, he's a year older than me, we're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And we had never had a full set. We would just go buy cards like 10 at a time. For Christmas one year, we got the full set. My father looked at us and said, boys, one day, this basketball card set is gonna pay for college for one of your kids. <laughs> I'm like, wow, it's really valuable. Turns out, had he taken that $50 and invested in the stock market and just let the thing ride, today I would have about $1,300. How much did I pay to share with you this entire box set, the 1991 NBA season, and shipping, and the little plastic cards that I made my kids stuff all the cards in for your protection? $19.44. How'd that work? They had an innovation, what did they do? They're like, how do we handle the daily crisis? We don't have any money. I was like, well, this is kind of a hot deal. They cranked out like a million sets. You wanna go right now, go to eBay and buy a full Skybox set, you can probably get it for under 20 bucks. Right? So you can have something that's innovative and still fumble it away. So the three steps we went through are lead with language, look beyond lumber, and learn by predicting. We started with this idea of bike shedding in a power plant. You guys may remember the power plant, nuclear power plant uh, in Fukushima, Japan, that had a meltdown in a reactor in 2011. Now, this is obviously not good. However, this is an extremely rare event in nuclear power plants. Does anyone remember how many people died? Do you remember? I want to take a guess. What's your name? Yeah, you. Jeff. Jeff. Did I give you one of these last year? No. I'll give you one now. Jeff, you, you went like this, right? Zero. Zero people died. Now, no one can go on that land for like 100 years. It's like a mini Chernobyl. It's not good. But within nuclear power plants, this occurrence is extremely rare, and not one person died. So the Japanese government, did they say, all right, how do we get innovative? How do we make sure this doesn't happen again? But, I feel like we dodged a bullet. They didn't. What did they do? They went backwards. They greenlit several coal-fired power plants. They are the only advanced nation on Earth, other than China, China doesn't count, only advanced nation on Earth to greenlight coal-fired power plants. Why? Because the people who went through this, it was stressful and horrifying and embarrassing 
And having gone through all of that emotion, said, we're, we're getting out of this game. So let's do what we've always done. Let's go back to what we know. Coal-fired power plants in general, not great for society, but it's better than this. Leaders must see the future. This is you. The job is to see the future and make sure your team is prepared to thrive there. And if you constantly feed yesterday and we constantly focus on the daily crisis, we're going to be starving tomorrow. They say change is normal and healthy. That's true. So is death. This is part of life. We've got to be really comfortable with the idea that this might not work. And the people that report to you that you lead need to understand that you guys aren't perfect and sometimes things are not going to work out, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try to innovate. What you guys think about your power plant? What is it with you and your people coming up new ideas and sharing those and knowing, this, no, this might not work, but this is the power to make sure that we survive for another 100 years in the future. And the only people that should be focused on bike sheds are these people. Thank you. Appreciate it.